And is this new distribution, D2, right, the one that happens at the end of the season, is this new distribution unjust? And if so, why? Okay, so Nozick thinks that this new distribution is perfectly just. Okay, and that's what he'll argue in the following passage. He says, there is no question about whether each of the people in this society was entitled to the control over the resources they held in D1, because that was the distribution, remember, your favorite, that for the purposes of argument we assumed was acceptable. Right? Each of these persons, persons chose to give 25 cents of their money to Chamberlain. They could have spent it on going to the movies or on candy bars or whatever, but they all, at least one million of them, converged on giving it to Will Chamberlain in exchange for watching him play basketball. If D1 was a just distribution and people voluntarily moved from it to D2, transferring parts of their shares they were given under D1, what was it for if not to do something with? Isn't D2 also just? Right? Can anyone else complain on grounds of justice? Each other person already has his legitimate share under D1. Under D1, there's nothing that anyone has that anyone else can claim that anyone else has a claim of justice against. After someone transfers something to Wilt Chamberlain, third parties still have their legitimate shares. Right? Their shares are not changed. By what process could such a transfer among two persons give rise to a legitimate claim of distributive justice on a portion of what was transferred? by a third party who has no claim of justice on any holding of the others before the transfers. Okay, so there is a lot there in that passage, and you're probably going to have to go through and reread it a few times, but that's good. That's philosophy. That's how it should be. But the basic idea that Nozick is presenting here is this. is like, look, there's no injustice by your own lights at time T1, right? That's at T1, everybody has what you think they should have. So no injustice there. Uh, so we move the time to T2. Is, is anything unjust there? Well, how, how could there be, right? Wilt, you know, knowingly and voluntarily signs this contract. The team knowingly and voluntarily signs the contract. Okay, Everybody, suppose it, all the fans know that the contract has been signed and they're all fine with it. So now we move on to, you know, go through the season. The fans knowingly and voluntarily give their 25 cents for each game to, to Wilt. They're all happy with it. They do it voluntarily and knowingly, right? Um, Wilt, who, who could complain on grounds of injustice, right? Could Wilt complain? No. Could the owners complain? No. Could the, the fans complain who gave their 25 cents each to Wilt? Well, no. They voluntarily gave that money to him. But what about everybody else in society? Right, the, the, the non-basketball fans or the people who live in different cities, are they, can they complain on grounds of injustice? Well, no, right, because they still have their, their shares that they had at D1. Okay, so that's the challenge here. All right, that's what this all, this point kind of amounts to. All right, the point of all this is that lots of people, so here's a sad Lionel Hutz over here, no longer dreaming of a world without lawyers. So lots of people when they consider this case, agree with Nozick's conclusion that Wilt is entitled to the $250,000 he ends up with here, even if that means that the society ends up unequal, or it now violates the difference principle, or it now fails to maximize net happiness, or it now fails to apportion primary social goods based on moral merit, or social usefulness, or need, or creativity, or whatever. Okay. Uh, According to Nozick, right, here's how he summarizes the result. He says, in short, what we learn from the Wilt Chamberlain case is that any distributive pattern we liked would be disrupted by, quote-unquote, capitalist acts between consenting adults. Okay, so any pattern we liked, any pattern that existed at D1, right, any pattern, will be disrupted by way of these kind of voluntary transactions between adults about choosing to give or receive their property in various ways. Okay? And so, this is why Lionel Hudson is sad, right? his perfect distribution is going to get kind of uh, ruined uh, unless. Right? An obvious objection here, or not even an objection at this point, just like a point to make in response to all this, 
is to say, yeah, there's nothing wrong with, you know, the contract or will having more money temporarily or whatever. But look, if we, what we should do is kind of at the end of the year, right, or at the end of the month or every five years, whatever, at the end of some period, we should try to restore our favored distribution, right, like D1 was. In the, in the way that we know how, right? Namely via taxes and government spending at the end of that period, right? So uh, yeah, let, let Wilt and the uh, team sign whatever contracts they want. But for example, if we wanna preserve an egalitarian distribution, just tax Wilt at a higher rate so that we have, so we can kind of distribute the money in a more equal way so we can restore the kind of equal distribution that we think is just. What's wrong with that? I think that's the obvious solution to this problem if you think of it as a problem. Well, <laughs> Nozick does respond to this objection, but he goes a little bit crazy in responding to it. Uh, for example, he makes the ridiculous claim that, quote, taxation of earnings from labor is on a par with forced labor, end quote. Now, I'm a philosopher, I encounter all sorts of strange and unusual claims and arguments, so I'm generally loath to say that any particular claim I encounter is ridiculous, but this is ridiculous. Okay, there's the analogy just breaks down immediately on kind of the first, first thoughts. Okay. But, okay, so he does engage in some hyperbolic exaggeration here, but putting those aside, there is a worry that he raises here. Okay, the worry that to maintain a pattern, one must either continually interfere to stop people from transferring resources as they wish, as they wish to, or continually or periodically interfere to take from some person's resources that others for some reason chose to transfer to them. That's worth thinking about, right? Does this kind of, this obvious procedure, right? The taxing and, and distribution, is that, does that amount to too much interference in a free people's life? That's a good question, right? It's worth thinking about. But to see the value of thinking about it, we have to set aside Nozick's just ridiculous uh, exaggerations here. Now, what do you think the best response to the Wilt Chamberlain case is? I mean, I've been thinking about this for years and years, and I go back and forth between several different possibilities. So I'm genuinely really interested to hear what you all think how you all think we should respond to it. So let me know. Okay, so now we've seen Nozick's major arguments for his entitlement theory of distributive justice. Uh, given how important the history of a distribution is to Nozick and how opposed Nozick is to the interference in people's lives that he sees is required to preserve patterned distributions and given his deep commitment to a basically Lockean picture of private property rights, his entitlement theory is a natural conclusion. Okay, so that's the that's the view and the basic reasons for it. Now, I just want us to discuss two final topics before we conclude this lecture. First, I want to talk about Nozick's criticisms of Rawls in particular. Now, in effect, right, arguments against pattern theories happen to be arguments against Rawls because Rawls's theory is a pattern theory. But there are several criticisms that Nozick makes of Rawls in particular, each of which is uh, worth talking about. So we'll talk about those briefly. And then at the very end, I'm going, to I'm going to talk about what Nozick's entitlement theory implies about whether our society is just, right? Because that's what we care about fundamentally in this unit, is whether our society is just, and if it's not, what changes we would have to make. So that'll be the final topic for today. Okay, so here are Nozick's objections to Rawls, or at least some of them. Uh, there's a kind of uh, a set of similar objections we can summarize as kind of the family example slash the grades example. And then there is what we can call the autonomy objection. Then there's what we can call the collective apps, assets objection. And then there's what we can call the priority of liberty objection. All right, so here's the family example and grades example. Family example first. As one indication of the stringency of Rawls's difference principle is its inappropriateness as a governing principle even within a family of individuals who love one another. Should a family devote its resources to maximizing the position of its least well-off and least talented child, holding back the other children, or using resources for their education and development only if they'll po follow a policy through their lifetimes of maximizing the position of their least fortunate sibling, 
Surely not, right? So Nozick says that uh, we should not use the difference principle when deciding how to d devote resources among different family members. OK, 